Dr. Hari Valpola is a computer scientist and entrepreneur with huge ambition. Four years ago, he started his company Curious AI in Helsinki because he wanted to realize his dream of the next level of artificial intelligence, going from system one to system two. It's a lofty ambition, and what does that entail? In the 1960s, many researchers thought that in just 10 years' time, it would be possible to build computers that are as good as humans in every cognitive task. So now, 50 years later, it's easy to say that, well, that didn't happen. My goal is to build human-like AI that my mother would be happy to work with. I started with asking, can we build this human-like AI? Yes, we can. Hari is an expert in machine learning, theoretical neuroscience and cognitive robotics. He's been an AI researcher for 25 years, having led multiple research groups, and his work has been published multiple times in the top machine learning conference, NeurIPS. He has even published work with Jan LeCun in 2012. Curious AI specialize in industrial and business process optimization. They've developed some extremely sophisticated approaches around unsupervised learning and model-based reinforcement learning. I hope many of you have read Daniel Kahneman's great book, Thinking Fast and Slow. We were having a wonderful discussion about System 1 versus System 2 last week when we dissected Yoshia Bengio's ICLR keynote presentation. Hari believes that model-based reinforcement learning approaches are System 2 because of the imagination, curiosity and planning that goes on inside these models. System 1 is the autopilot. It's the it's the part of my brain that's doing biking, for instance. It's very fast. It, it's intuitive. I don't need to think about it. In fact, I cannot think about it. I, I cannot explain how I do it. I just do it. It's unconscious. Fully automatic and crystallized knowledge. It's something that I learned from experience, from a lot of data. Sounds familiar, right? Very much like artificial intelligence these days. What we have now in AI is this system one. What we are missing is this creative system two, which is able to handle new situations. My brain is able to imagine things. I have simulations going on inside my brain, and that's the foundation of this system two. This is what we need to build. Without that, we would be like reflex machines. And reflex machines is how deep learning looks like. So system two, it relies on internal models, planning, and then selection over different possible future outcomes. It's slow because you have to simulate the world and then select the best outcomes. You may have heard about AlphaGo. AlphaGo is an example of a AI system that relies on planning. So it has system two. It's not general artificial intelligence because the model that it's using is hand-coded. It knows the rules of the game. They have been handcrafted there. But having this ability to plan forward, it's able to start to learn the game of golf from scratch. It doesn't know how to make good moves. It doesn't know how good a particular board situation is when it starts but it does know the rules of the game. So it starts playing against itself in its head. It's thinking, thinking, thinking. Millions and millions of games. It's thinking about the game and it's developing this expertise. How do you make a business out of AI? I think too many of us are familiar with the situation where you're starting on a real world project and the best solution is just the linear regression or a K-nearest neighbor classifier. Here is someone that makes state-of-the-art machine learning into a company and actually makes money out of that. One configuration of reinforcement learning is that you code an expert system simulator from first principles and learn your policy from that. The policy is the model in reinforcement learning that predicts which action to take based on the current situation. 
You can even use the simulator for planning ahead from your current situation without needing to take action in the real world. And this has been successfully used in robotics and gaming. But what if you don't have the luxury of knowing how to write your environment simulator using code? Sometimes writing even an approximate simulator for a well-known system is extremely expensive. Aligning your simulator to your actual process can be challenging, and also the environment is often non-stationary. In this situation, we create a world model using machine learning to simulate our environment instead. One of the benefits of using your imagination, so to speak, is that you get orders of magnitude better sample efficiency, which is one of the biggest problems dogging reinforcement learning. In model-based reinforcement learning, planning is done by computing the expected result of a sequence of future actions given this learned model of the environment. This is not without challenges though. Out of distribution generalization errors and optimization failures due to adversarial examples and model overfitting are common challenges with model-based deep reinforcement learning. The folks at Curious AI have come up with some extremely interesting solutions to this. For example, using denoising autoencoders and are also working on some new approaches for planning and exploration. In model-based reinforcement learning, we want to model the transitions in the environment. A powerful world model can accurately predict the next state given a state action pair. In a recent study, GameGAN, researchers from NVIDIA showed that they could emulate Pac-Man inside of a world model. This world model can model the state action next state transitions in the pixel space. Another paper, World Models from David Ha and Jurgen Schmidhuber, show a similar success modeling VizDoom with a variational autoencoder in pixel space. Many other techniques don't bother modeling the high dimensional pixel space. Models such as Mu0 and Dreamer learn transitions in a compressed, latent space, saving computational efficiency and still achieving the sample efficiency of model-based reinforcement learning. The ability to predict the future in these world models enables agents to utilize planning to take better actions. Planning algorithms such as the Monte Carlo tree search used in AlphaGo look ahead several steps to get a better sense of the immediate action. In regularizing trajectory optimization with denoising autoencoders, Valpola and his collaborators describe planning as an adversarial attack against the agent's own forward model, where these planning algorithms exploit errors in the future predictions to propose trajectories that don't work in the real world. In the paper, they present a technique using denoising autoencoders to deal with this uncertainty. Usually we think of model-based reinforcement learning for vision and modeling sequences of RGB frames. But Curious AI is on the cutting edge of using these techniques to model industrial control processes such as paper mills or sewage systems. I'm really looking forward to learning more about the challenges of model-based reinforcement learning with this kind of data and Harry's perspective on this direction of reinforcement learning. In the most recent NeurIPS, the number one machine learning conference, Curious AI published a paper called Regularizing Trajectory Optimization with Denoising Autoencoders. Yannick was really interested in this and he made a comprehensive video on his own YouTube channel. I just want to include 10 minutes of that video here to give you guys a flavor of the kind of innovative technology that Curious AI are developing. Model-based reinforcement learning means that you are using a model of the world to do reinforcement learning. So in essence, if you have your reinforcement learning set up where you are an agent and you have to interact with the world, you have to do so in many steps in like a round trip fashion. So you put an action, you act, and the world gives you back an observation. And you have to act in the world over and over and over such that you will be able to maximize your reward. Now, what is model-based reinforcement learning? Model-based reinforcement learning basically means that the agent here has internally a model of the world. So it sort of understands how the world works. Situations where you have a accurate model of the world are things like chess. So in chess, the rules are very clear. You know how the world's gonna behave if you perform a certain action. But in real world applications, it's very, very hard to actually make a model. So people usually rely on learned models. So what does it mean? You basically learn a neural network that tries to um, predict how the world is going to act. So this here is going to be a deep neural network that you learn from what you see in the world. Now, trajectory optimization 
basically means that you now have this world model and you use it to look ahead. So you are in the state like here and you can do, let's say, three different actions. And you use your world model here, world. And you see, you think, how's the world going to react if I do either of those three things? And then you get into three different states. And then again, you, after each one, you consider three actions, three actions here three actions here and so on. So ultimately, you're going to kind of have an overview over a planning horizon, which here we call H, you kind of look ahead a couple of steps, or there are various ways of doing this. But ultimately, you will basically find that ah, this this path here is really good. So I think I'm going to take this as a first action. So trajectory optimization considers finding the best green path here in this tree of possibilities that your, your world model gives you. What do these people say? They say this procedure often suffers from exploiting inaccuracies of the learned model. What does that mean? That basically means that if I have a world model and it is not accurate, then it is basically the the thing that tries to find the best green path here, the optimizer, is trying to find the, the best path against this world model. Now, if that world model is inaccurate, that can lead to devastating consequences. So what do we mean by this? I'll give you an example. If you have a room, right, and the room is, let's take our classic room like this, and you are here and you would like to go here, right? And so you're a reinforcement learning agent. You do some exploration, right? You explore a bit here. The next episode, you might go here and you might go here and so on. And over time in this framework, you're going to build a model of the world. So at the beginning, we won't tell you how these rooms look. You have to discover it by yourself. So maybe at the beginning, we only tell you uh, there's these four walls. The rest you have to figure out. So on and on, you're going to fill in your blanks. You do your first explorations and you say, ah, there's a bit of a wall here, right? And uh, there might be some wall here. I crashed into that, right? You go into here, you crash into a wall. You say, ah, there's a wall here and here. Ah, there's a wall here. You go maybe here. Oh, there's no wall. So you go further. There's no wall anywhere here. You crash here. Okay, we already knew there's a wall. Maybe you crash here. All right, so right now you have, okay, you go here, you have, you have a model of the world in this situation where there's a wall here, a wall down. And if you now try to do trajectory optimization, remember, you have to go from here to here. If you try to do trajectory optimization, what is it going to turn out? It's going to turn out like, look, there you go. <laughs> that works just fine. And that's be not because you're so good at planning. I mean, you are good at planning, but because your model is inaccurate here, because it has never seen this, your entire training distribution that you trained the world model on only explored the area over here. Right? So you see how the more efficient this planning algorithm is, like the blue arrow, the, the thing that finds the blue arrow, the more efficient that is, the more consequential it is when your learned world model has mistakes, because it will exploit these mistakes in order to get the shortest path possible or the highest reward in that case. They, they call this like almost an adversarial attack on the world model, which is a pretty good way of framing it. They propose to solve this problem. They say we propose to regularize trajectory optimization by means of a denoising autoencoder that is trained on the same trajectories as the model of the environment. We show that the proposed regularization leads to improved planning with both gradient based and gradient free optimizers. Important to note here is that the world model will only learn about things that you have done, right? So there is kind of an interaction effect. That's the green area here. The world model only knows the paths. The world model only can ac accurately estimate the world where you have been. And that's going to turn out to be the entire problem because <laughs> the, this blue arrow finder can now go away from the potential inaccuracies of the trained model cause substantial difficulties for the planning process. 
Rather than optimizing what really happens, planning can easily end up exploiting the weaknesses of the predictive model. Planning is effectively an adversarial attack against the agent's own forward model. This results in a wide gap between expectations based on the model and what actually happens. Okay, and they have this, this example here where it's like an industrial control process. And what you have to imagine, there's like some sort of a container here with a liquid in it. And there are two, two pipes that lead to this container, pipe one and pipe two. And there are valves here. So there's this valve right here and there's this valve right here. So these are valve one and valve two. And there is also an output pipe right here. And that's a another valve right here. So you can control these three valves, the in two inputs and one output. And you have to um, somehow optimize the reaction in here. So this is a chemical reaction made up out of the two liquids that flow in here. And you have to somehow optimize a property of that. And that's highly nonlinear and has maybe like time, uh, time shift. So when you open a valve, it's going to take a while and then it's very nonlinear. And then you are not supposed to break the pressure limit. So you have to also outflow some stuff. And if you just do this with a learned model, it looks like this. So first of all, here is a classic controller. Like people have been doing this stuff in industry and they basically build controllers for it. And you can, you can do that and that works out really okay-ish. As you can see right here, this is the product rate, what you're supposed to optimize. And you see some sort of a smooth, you're supposed to actually bring it to this dashed line right here. And this is some sort of smooth thing right <laughs> and you're supposed to i guess bring the pressure here and the a in purge i don't know what these quantities are but you're supposed to bring them to the dashed line and it's very non-linear um, and very time dependent so that works and you see here kind of the smoothness by which the variables are manipulated now if you just learn a world model and then do this trajectory optimization you see right here, it works, but it's super jittery. The pressure spikes here and apparently this here is a pressure limit. So it spikes the pressure limit. And you can see that the manipulated variables are up and down and up and down and up and down because at each step, it basically completely overestimates its potential reward. It thinks like, wow, this is really good. But all it does is find a weakness in the model and not a really good action per se. Now with their method to already take it away, you can see that now the control task super smoothly and very quickly converges to these optimal things. And you can see that the variables being manipulated are also rather smoothly manipulated. And that's an indication that the model is accurately estimating the rewards. If we go back to our rooms example, right, you, you see that anywhere in the green area where I have already explored, the world model is fairly good, right? It, it's going to give me accurate reflection of the world. But as soon as I go outside the green area, it is not. And inside the green area is basically where my training data is. Now, if I in the future actually take a path here, crash into a wall right here, right? You saw in the algorithm at the end of an episode, I'm going to add my trajectory to the training data for the world model. So this green part here expands to include that. And now if I go here again, if my plan goes there again, now I can trust the world model, but also now it has, it is actually correct because it has a wall here. So you see that the regularization, basically you, not only do I want the biggest reward possible under my world model, I also want that the plan that I'm about to execute is, has a high probability under my training distribution. Okay. And the way we do this is by denoising autoencoders. Now, when I go and do my trajectory optimization and my trajectory optimization wants to go here, I simply say, no, I don't know that. I haven't seen that yet. You can only plan basically within the space where we have already been. So you can plan like here. So here now there, there is, of course, there is going to be some exploration. So some 
probability that you can go away a bit, but not too much, right? So in this case, it would result in the planning only to happen in spaces where we've actually been. So it might go here and then here because, okay, here we haven't been anywhere. But then that would lead me to take the first step in this direction and not in this direction. And if I take my first step in this first direction, then of course, I'm going to be already a bit on the correct path right here. Whereas I t if I take the first step into this direction, then after that, I'm gonna have to, if once I crash here, I'm gonna have to correct really hard. And that's exactly what's going to give you this super jittery control. It is incredibly fascinating to listen to Hari. And I had a lot of fun talking to him. And I hope there is a nugget of advice for everyone in there. I think that was a great opportunity for Yannick to show some context and demonstrate the exciting technology that Curious AI are working on. We had a fantastic conversation with Hari and we really appreciate that he came on the show to talk with us. So without further delay, I give you Hari Valpola. Welcome back, folks, to the Machine Learning Street Talk channel with me, my two compadres, Yannick Kilcher, Connor Shorten. And today we are incredibly uh, excited about this. We've got a guest on, Hari, who started a reinforcement learning company in, in Europe. And we've been talking a lot about System 1 versus System 2. and. Hari's company is all about embracing this next paradigm of, of computation, this, this system two. And last week, Hari, we actually used your analogy of uh, the, the monkey, which was when, when these cards were handed out and humans could spot the hidden rule very quickly. They had to classify these cards into one or two classes and monkeys don't spot the hidden rule. So th there was an assertion there that humans have this higher level of thinking, this so-called system two. Can, can, can you give me the elevator pitch, Hari? Yeah, thanks, Tim. So elevator pitch about monkeys and system two or elevator pitch about what Curious AI is doing about building AI that actually has system two. Well, I, I think the first thing is a wonderful segue into the second thing. Okay, so there is this interesting experiment where where you train or no, give give a, uh, monkeys or humans a recognition or classification task, which the test subject doesn't know about in advance. So it's really a test about how quickly you can extract some some rules and you know, recognition system. And monkeys and humans oftentimes also when when they pick up the first card and then they w will see some kind of funny image and then they will need to make a decision. Is this A or B? They will start making their guesses and then gradually by getting feedback, they, they learn and they, they improve their performance gradually. But uh, sometimes humans figure out the rule, like they, they can explicitly tell Oh, okay. I, I understand. So the rule seems to be that if you have a black and white picture, then it's class A. And if it's colored picture, then it's class B. When they are able to ex explicitly tell out the rule, their performance immediately jumps to 100%. So this is very typical of system two thinking. As long as it's this big data AI, system one AI or system one learning, uh, it's, it's going to be gradual and slow. It's an instantaneous intuitive response. We just know, okay, this, this card looks like A. You can't say why, but that's, that's how, it, how it looks like. But the moment you spot the rule, once you understand it in deeper level, you are able to engage your system too, and you get everything 100% correct. So that's the kind of learning that's, that we see in humans sometimes. So sometimes people are not able to pick up the rule and then they will follow the monkey path. So the, their learning performance follows pretty much the monkeys. But once, the, if they get the rule, then it's just uh, instantaneous. And, and you, you said that this system too is quite slow for thinking, but fast for learning. 
Yeah, system two requires you to think a while. Like when when you get a card, you you need to match the what you see with your rule, and it's like a deliberate thought process that takes a little while. So it's not instantaneous, but actually, once you get the rule, you will also start engaging your system one pretty quickly, so that. The system two can train system one to respond really quickly. But system two thinking inherently is slow. That's why Daniel Kahneman in his book, I mean, it, 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 was, it was titled Thinking Fast and Slow. So fast referring to system one and slow referring to system two. But when it comes to speed of learning, it's actually reversed. So system two requires big data. It's always slow to learn, but system two can be really data efficient. Do you think that there is a dichotomy in thinking in humans? Because we had a wonderful discussion last week. And as an aside, we had a comment on our YouTube channel that Daniel Kahneman apparently now regrets some of the things he said in thinking fast and slow. A lot of the experiments weren't reproducible and they were poorly designed and, and so on. But I, I think it serves as, as a wonderful analogy architecturally, if nothing else. But last week, we were having a fascinating discussion where we were being quite cynical and, and we thought, well, if, if system two is about taking shortcuts, then when that new piece of knowledge or skill has been consolidated, does it just become system one? Well, I would say that uh, there is a, like, under the hood, there's a clear difference about how system one works compared to system two. Uh, it's, I mean, if, if you really start digging into it, nothing is black and white. So it's, uh, I wouldn't say that there's a clear and definitely there is no clear anatomical separation between system one and system two. So it's rather two different modes of thinking. But what really sets system two apart from system one, if you think of algorithmically, I guess in this, this uh, panel, we are allowed to talk algorithms, right? Uh, so system two has an internal model of the world. And it's running internal simulations of that world. And this is, this is a function that system one just skips. It just jumps into conclusions. Much like if you think of a ordinary deep neural network, inputs and then computation layer by layer, and then you have the output. Computation is instantaneous, uh, more or less, but there isn't thinking behind it. Whereas when we build system two AI, that's, that means to me that we are building AI that's actually running some internal modeling of the world, running simulations. So I think there is a clear distinction between what system one and system two can do. I think there is a meaningful distinction also like algorithm wise the world is never black and white so there are there are differences but if you for instance have a reinforcement learning system then i think model free and model based th there there is a difference and clearly with with this definition of that i just gave uh model based would be system two because it has an internal model it's running some simulations and it's basing it's planning on on that uh, the decisions are based on on running internal simulations but if you build a complete system you also want to include policy network which is initializing the plans or sometimes getting getting the the decisions right away and that's system one and you want to combine those two. What do you think of uh, Joshua Benjo's sort of approach that system two knowledge is whatever you can verbalize? How do you, how do you think of that? Because that kind of uh, was a bit controversial in our, in our conversation last, last week. Well, I think if you want to measure what system one and system two in humans, uh, asking up to verbalize is clearly and uh, a simple way to check that. So it's a very practical uh, way to check. I don't think that it's a good definition of what the distinction between system one and system two, but it's, it's certainly a practical way of probing it. 
because they're all they're all sort of uh, a little bit different from each other. There is this okay, can I verbalize it? Then there is the the aspect of does it run sort of internal simulations? Because not even though let's say AlphaGo is running inter- internal simulations, you can't really make all, a verbalization out of it. Right. It simply it simply goes down the Monte Carlo tree search more often. It it can't necessarily tell you why because it this is guided by the the system one thinking and so on. So I think I think it is yeah. There there's these multiple aspects of things, and as you say, nothing is nothing is black and white. So yeah, and I think what what makes it um, a little bit confusing maybe is that as you said, like Al- Alpha Go or Alpha Zero. It, it does have also the policy, which is guiding this planning. But I would say that it definitely has system two in that it's explicitly selecting the the decisions that are predicted to yield the best outcome based on that simulator. And in, in the case of Alpha Zero, the, the simulator is handcrafted. We already know the games of uh, the rules of games. So we, we can just handcraft those simulators and all all uh, chess engines are basically running this kind of system to ai they're not learning necessarily anything and they don't necessarily have uh, system one but i mean oh that could be handcrafted too but i i think that's for instance we we can say that in alpha alpha zero under my definition the policy part would be system one thinking but the running the simulations that would be the system two part and it doesn't it, yeah so if we know the algorithm then we can make this distinction but if you if you are asking a human or a monkey then that's we, we don't know exactly the the algorithm and we can't probe that directly so if if we if we stay with this definition of running internal simulation then of course the the immediate question is where does the simulator come from right i think that's that's like the the big part because in let's say classic ai you would rely on the fact that you know the simulator like alphago but also you know the classic whatever a star search algorithms expert systems whatnot you know the simulator and so i mean there is there is this question where does the simulator come from is it learned jointly or maybe in humans you could argue a lot of the simulators are built into by evolution right so it's it's sort of a you have a physics simulator inside of you from birth just given to you by that outer process so we can we can imagine that so many levels it can be completely handcrafted it can be like meta learned as in there's an outer process that learns the simulator and then there's an inner process learning or it can be jointly learned with you acting in the world basically you make a model of the world what is what is sort of the what is the most interesting thing you think in this space well i think that's uh, the interesting bit is is learning the world model from from data and you said for instance humans come in built with a lot of physics knowledge i actually think that there is a lot of uh, developmental psychology pointing to the direction that no actually we need to learn physics that we are quite prepared to live in which whichever physical reality when we are born um, we we learn all kinds of things even starting from object constancy from from experience so it's it's something that you're not hardwired with but you you learn that very quickly you don't need to have years and years of experience but you can learn physics from data pretty quickly and efficiently i I think it's interesting that some things do seem to be baked into us as evolutionary priors and some things we do learn later you gave the example of object permanence i think monkeys actually learn object permanence much quicker than humans do and i'm interested in system two in terms of learning games i think there was a paper in iClear a year or two ago and it was asking the question, why do humans learn how to beat games so much faster? We're so much more sample efficient. And it's exactly as Yannick was saying, we understand gravity. They did an experiment where they took away some of the textures in the Atari games because we know what a ladder means. 
We know what a platform means. Actually, if you turn the thing upside down, so gravity doesn't make sense anymore. If you, if you remove enough priors that humans have, then we are not much better than the algorithm at that point. And what's your opinion on AlphaGo? I think the way it's been branded in the media is that in the olden days, it was brute force searching in chess in uh, deep blue. We were just brute force searching this tree. And if with AlphaGo, it was supposedly completely different. We now have this, this policy. I think in AlphaGo, they combined the value and the policy network into one. But I think if you just follow the policy from this network, the performance isn't that good. It's still doing this Monte Carlo tree search. It's not really that different in some sense to what came before. Yeah, I think it's there's a very long tradition actually in that. So I think, do you know this Samuel's Checkers? It's, I think it's from 50s or something. And in that, that was already combining planning with learning at least the value functions and so on. So I think there is actually quite long tradition in, in combining some, something like data, data driven learning with, with planning and that didn't learn and didn't need to learn the rules of the game, but so didn't alpha, alpha go, alpha zero. So that, that was inbuilt. So in many ways, I think the, the, the C's have been there for, for a long time, but obviously uh, alpha zero and alpha go uh, at, at first, it was a huge undertaking in like really, really building, uh, building this system that that can actually do that with all the compute that that deep mind had at, at the disposal. So that that wasn't something that ordinary grad student could have done simply because they would have lacked the the compute. A friend and colleague of mine actually predicted a year before that we are at the brink of um, this revolution that is going to happen soon. He didn't know about any of the work that DeepMind was doing, but based on the on the papers that 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 had been uh, there already that were being published, he predicted that we are going to make this breakthrough like human level go in yeah in about a year and then that was a year before. Last week we were having a fascinating discussion it was a it was a trichotomous discussion. We were talking about consciousness and we were talking about intelligence and we were talking about machine learning. And at the at the intro of that episode, we played some clips from Christoph Koch, and he was saying that consciousness is just experience. And Francois Chalet says the same thing. He says that consciousness is a distraction. Evolution is very intelligent, but it's not conscious. And conscious is according to Francois Chalet, just about emotions. It's not something we should be particularly interested in unless we have an anthropocentric view of intelligence. But on intelligence, Chalet says that it's all about generalization difficulty, kind of divided by the priors in terms of knowledge and, and skills. And in that setting, some of these reinforcement learning algorithms are not intelligent. But the way you're framing it is they are exceptional in some circumstances. For example, they do planning. They can do things that we haven't been able to do before. And you're making an argument that, that we're heading towards a phase change in intelligence. So how do you wrestle with these uh, aspects? Well, about consciousness, first of all, I, I think that consciousness is what the brain does. So that's my personal view, view of that. So it's uh, it, when, when we built this, this more more and more intelligent ai systems i think we are building into them things like the ability to simulate the world and also ability to guide their own planning guide their own thinking and i think that at, at some point these systems will be conscious in the same way as as we are but i think the consciousness is is not the goal but it's just a very like that, that that's what the system will do when it's thinking eventually so i think that now a lot of a lot of ai and particularly the the machine learning related parts of ai have been dominated by this system one thinking 
big data, take a lot of data and just learn a very efficient mapping from inputs to outputs. And that's, it's very, very useful technology. And without that, humans, like without system one thinking, we would be completely handicapped. We would, we would be thinking constantly about just moving this joint or that joint, or like we wouldn't get very far in life. So it's very important that you have something like system one. But I think that the, for the past decade, AI being dominated by deep learning and so on was a bit imbalanced in that system two AI wasn't really making a dent. Uh, the good old fashioned AI, on the other hand, in, you might argue that that was all about system two AI. It was all about planning and reasoning. And now putting those thing, things together, I think will be tremendously valuable. And it's, it's going to be yeah, I, I think this this decade will be about actually putting those things together. And I think that it, uh, as an end result, we will have something like conscious machines. This is a bit of a segue, but how does one build a company on this? I think of AI like it's cool. I do it at university and OK, machine learning has some business applications. But then when I think of level two AI, I think of uh, games and and yeah, go and, 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 you know, all these kind of playful tasks. How does one make money with this? Yeah. Or that's how do a, you make money? <laughs> that, that's, that's a good question. One, one answer would be like, tell me immediately when you find out. The, the other, <laughs> other thing is uh, I was once in a conference where Jeff Hinton was talking about his, his research. And he said that uh, in his mind, like, and he was talking about a lot of neuroscientists saying that well, this stuff that you've built has nothing to do with brain. Hinton said that the thing about brain, like he thinks one of the most important features about the brain is that it works. It can actually solve real world problems. And I think that's, that's a very good way towards like really advanced AI. Build something that solves real world problems. Now, if you pick the wrong sort of problem, you might end up in the wrong ecological niche and you might be developing stuff which doesn't actually then in the long run lead to uh, advanced AI. And if, if we look at animal evolution, we can see many, many examples of this. So there, there were many uh, branches of animals which developed very, very uh, clever things and clever brains that, that achieved many things, but didn't really get further than that and definitely didn't go all the way to moon. So we, we have been in Curious AI, we have been trying to find the kinds of uh, problems that are worth solving and whose solutions will take us step by step a little bit closer to, to building real AI. And I'm not saying that's easy. Uh, we, when we started the company, we, we had some very good investors who, who believed in this track. And we, we spent a few years just developing uh, the algorithms and figuring out what, what we can do better than, than anybody else. And then, then you are at the starting point where which is even before normal companies that which is like okay now we we have some cool technology we know what it can do we know it's better now let's try to make business out of it so that might be might be the starting point of of many startups and then then you start looking for the the right application and now now we have figured it out now we know what we can do like where where this tech we've developed is is much better than anything else but we've spent like four and a half years already in the company life. And now we are ready to go to market with a product. So I, I guess you need to have also uh, patient investors if you, if you want to do it this way. And it wouldn't have been possible if not for my previous company. So the investors already knew, knew me and uh, knew that. The, the stuff that we are building has great potential. So they, they've been patient. 
it seems crazy. Imagine going to an investor and say, please give me money for four and a half years. And uh, after four and a half years, we might start looking for, for a problem. <laughs> so if, if you can say, what, what is the, the problem that you now found? Just as a quick aside <laughs> on that, Yannick, if, if the reward comes after four years, you need to do some reward shaping. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you need to tell the investors soon, soon, no, soon, very soon. Develop this system to AI, AI which is running its internal simulation. So, so much like Alpha Zero, actually, except that if you go to real world, many problems don't have a simple, nice game environment type place where you, it's easy to just type in the rules of the game. Most real world problems are such that you don't actually know what the rules are. And what we've developed is, is this system to AI that can learn the rules of the game and then solve, solve the game. So this is, this is something that actually has a long tradition in control engineering. So control theory is, is all about optimal control. You, you assume some kind of system model and then you solve for it. So now we are just crossbreeding good old-fashioned control engineering with modern AI. So we can use deep neural networks to learn process models and then we can apply them across industries. So controlling complex, high-dimensional, non-linear processes with delays and change and all of all of those things that you you encounter in the real world that's what we do yeah i, I think this is really interesting because so many of the uh, reinforcement learning papers that that we look at are focused in the artificial world they're focused on computer games which are completely observable the Atari system for using deep Q networks from DeepMind, that was a model-free method, which meant it was learning the policy by interacting directly with the system. And in the real world, you don't necessarily have that luxury of being able to interact with, with the real world. And this is when we start getting into model-based machine learning, where we build a model of our environment, which means we can learn inside our virtual world without having to interact with the real world. And it seems to open up all sorts of interesting possibilities because we can explore this virtual world as well. And, and Yannick did a wonderful um, a video about the, the curiosity paper um, uh, recently. So th this model-based reinforcement learning is, is squarely where, where you folks are pitched. Is that correct? That's correct. And Tim, you mentioned that um, model-based approaches allow you to learn inside your internal simulation. But I think that actually, at least as important, if not even more, is the ability to solve new situations that you didn't anticipate before. So if you think, for instance, what, uh, what makes alpha, alpha zero so, so good is not just the policy that it learned in the end, but it's the ability to actually apply planning for that game position that you now have in front of you. So uh, a lot of model-based reinforcement learning, which is like using these internal models, has been focused on using those models for generating experience inside which is then distilled into a policy network but i think that everybody would like to do proper planning like online planning plan for plan the best actions for this situation that you have in front of you so that's that's the kind of thing that we've we've been developing proper model based ai so you describe planning as an adversarial attack on the model. Could you tell me a little more about like this idea of that, like the how the model kind of compounds its errors as it predicts into the future and then kind of the open loop versus closed loop differences with these world models? Yeah. So the reason why planning has been so difficult to, to tame is that if you have any weaknesses in your model, planning process will immediately exploit those because planning is trying to find something completely different, something new, some new way of 
doing things and if you're not careful then and and with with models that have learned from data it's it's clear that the model will not be accurate outside of the training manifold and that's that's clear that's just life it's it's unavoidable it's not possible to know something where you don't have any experience uh, so what what this planning is essentially doing it's it's the same thing as what what you would like uh, it's a recipe for adversarial attack so let's take an example of a classifier we I, I guess everybody's heard about these examples where you pick a perfectly good classifier which can classify uh, almost any images that are thrown at it but then when you start generating an image and you say uh, th there's this panda given classic example so you you take an image of panda and then the network correctly classifies it as such but then you ask okay how should i change this input so that it would look like a gibbon so you you reverse the network you use it as a generator and it produces complete gibberish this is what happens also if you if you pick neural network models that are able to predict what will happen if in this process if i do if i apply these controls so the controls are inputs to the predictive model and the outcome is something that then you want to optimize. And now when you try to work your way backward from your desired goals to inputs, you are generating an, the control, but actually what happens is that you are generating an adversarial example, if you're not careful. So that's that's been a problem that's uh it's it's not just me thinking that that's that's a problem there was a awesome talk in last year's iClear by Timothy Lillicrap so i think Tim said that that's that's the problem that they had stumbled upon in in deep mind and that's that's something that we started working on more than 3 years ago and we managed to solve it uh, i i'd say it's because we had this background in in unsupervised learning helsinki has always been very strong in unsupervised learning due to the uh, pioneering work of, of my first boss devo kohonen he he invented these self self organized organizing maps and uh, i i was working on all kinds of unsupervised learning things when i i started as a researcher and Unsupervised learning with deep neural networks has been at the heart of solving this problem. Because when you generate uh, your controls or when you're generating your pandas and gibbons, you need to be aware of your input distribution. And that's, that's really the realm of uh, unsupervised learning, trying to understand your input distribution properly. One of the things, though, is I, th I think CNNs, for example, are really good at encoding the system one representations of the visual environment. Reinforcement learning seems to struggle with the sparse rewards, and it's very, very difficult to train these systems. And I don't think the problem is having good representations for the system state. We, in, we encode so much prior information into these architectures, like the, the OpenAI uh, Dota 5 system. They had loads of reward shaping. If you pick up a bit of gold, you get a point. If you do this, you get a point. And one thing that concerns me is we, we're supposed to be moving away from expert systems. What we want is to have systems that genuinely learn from data. But I think people are often surprised by the amount of prior knowledge and, and skills that we are imputing into these systems yeah then again i think that these deep neural networks they really have made made a breakthrough in in how little domain knowledge we actually need to develop efficient and functioning uh, systems so maybe not in in these dota game examples but like when when people started applying to competitions machine vision or speech recognition or drug development or, or what, whatever these competitions, uh, they weren't 
experts in in those domains. They were experts in building these deep neural networks, and then they started winning winning the competitions. Of course, always when you when you single in in one particular application domain, uh, you I mean it's it's possible to start developing better and better models by combining very flexible learning systems with a lot of domain specific knowledge but i th i think that the uh, initial solution provided but just by just taking a pretty much vanilla lstm networks applying that to whatever industrial processes that's worked surprisingly well so I guess this is not good advertisement for our customers, but really, we really are not experts in process control. I can tell you about these deep neural networks. They are great at extracting the relevant knowledge. We need to understand a little bit about the processes for sure. But yeah, uh, I think more or less we can just be content with predicting the future observations and be done with that. So I I want to go back a little bit because to to just what what uh, what your company or a company like yours would do, and I I think so maybe I came up with sort of an example that you could solve, and maybe you can say if that's correct or not. So if you think of for example a sewage treatment plant, right? You have like whatever water coming in from all kinds of places. You need to guide it through various basins. There's like a biological component where you use bacteria to clean it in this tank and so on. Then this can, you know, drop away and then you have an outage here and and there you have all these kinds of delays. So, and, and you need to kind of set all these valves such that the water flows and it needs to be clean and and is this the kind of systems you're talking about? Like I, I'm having a bit of a hard time imagining exactly like what you do. Is this the sort of things that you would tackle with your um, AI? Are you sure that we didn't discuss about this? Uh, no, before? are you doing this? <laughs> so, uh, today, today I had a call with some uh, control experts in sewage <laughs> systems. <laughs> Spot on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this, I mean, this gives me a better idea because... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's I mean, exactly it. Like if you think of those kinds of uh, processes, they are, they are really difficult to properly model using physical or like actually you need physical and chemical and biological knowledge like really modeling it properly is uh well i i guess it's really impossible but we can collect data from that system humans are operating those systems every day and humans learn to understand roughly okay if i turn this valve then that liquid turns brownish and that's good because then down the line it's clean water uh, so humans learn to make these these kinds of predictions and causal models and then they are able to apply these models when something breaks for instance suddenly okay let's take an example which everybody is hopefully no, no nobody's familiar with but suppose that we are flying an airplane and suddenly an engine one one engine shut off, shuts off the the dynamics of of the airplane change quite immediately and you you'd hope that the pilot is able to learn the new dynamics and figure out a way how to fly the plane and this is this is this kind of stuff is actually something that also happens in industry components could, break and you still need to clean that water could, could we linger on Yannick's example? Because I think this is very instructive. I mean, when, when you read papers about model-based reinforcement learning, they might be talking about playing Doom or Quake, and you might make a model which will take in the pixels of your current scene, and it would learn, well, this person pressed the forward button and this was the next frame. So you're, you're kind of learning, you know, given given this scene and this action, what's what's the observation likely to be if if I did that? In this case that Yannick just sketched out, it seems to be a little bit more heterogeneous. So, would you need multiple models for the different aspects of the system? Uh, so we've been 
happy with just having one, one big model. Uh, if you have, for instance, different types of sensors, then you might want to have different pre-processing stages. So if, if they are not just thermometers and pressure sensors and flow sensors and that kind of like one dimensional signal sensors. If you also have cameras, for instance, then you don't want to put those all in this, like you don't want to treat them the same way, but then you'd apply, you know, convolutional networks for, for that particular sensor input. But by and large, I'd, I'd say, yeah, I mean, you just throw it all into the same, same big deep neural network and it works great so that's that's the promise of deep so, learning right so do you like have a separate cnn for the camera data and then like you know maybe some kind of lcm for the 1d and like kind of fuse in these features later on or is yeah, it like that's right. all the way but, but i i can tell you that we have been be working on on camera data with with these these problems and and frankly i don't think that it's very sensible to apply reinforcement learning for vision problems it's I mean, it's so much more sensible to just apply good old-fashioned machine vision and then apply reinforcement learning on on the re reasonable feature representation oh i'm surprised to hear you say that because I, as i was saying before i think that things like CNNs are really, really good at, at finding good features from even pixels. You, know, you, you can you uh, can learn the state of an Atari game. But one thing I did want to understand is I'm trying to place where your differentiated um, capability is. And I, I don't completely understand because I know there's a lot of work around this curiosity paper, for example. That's all about every single action you take, you kind of you see how how much of a surprise was it? How predictable was it? And you can use something like that to encourage exploration of you know parts of the environment that you don't know much about. So so that that's about exploration. But when I've been reading some of the materials on your website, it seems to be more around uh, regularization to perform well um, outside of the manifold or outside of your training domain. Or it, is is it is it more that, or is there an exploration element to it as well? There is an exploration element. Unfortunately, that's uh, still unpublished work, so can't talk much about it. But hey, the name of the company is Curious AI, so you, you'd expect us to have some something on exploration too. Uh, but yeah, the the thing that we have managed to crack really properly is combining deep neural networks for learning or or other data driven models for learning the system dynamics and couple that with very efficient uh, optimization techniques. And the, the problem that people have struggled with in, in trying to do this is that is this adversarial planning attack problem, that planning actually exposes any and all of the weaknesses that the model will have. And what we've done is we've, we've been able to regularize the the planning process uh, such that the planning will will stay within the familiar within mani familiar manifold of to to the network so it's actually actually it's kind of anti curiosity that <laughs> that makes this thing thing work so yeah, I know there's some irony to that, that, but yeah, so we've developed this anti-curiosity, which actually makes it possible to develop proper system to model-based reinforcement learning and add proper curiosity on top of that. So, so th th just, just really quickly, I'm just reading a bit from your paper. Because uh, the way you, you frame it up in, uh, and Hari is a, a NIPS published, uh, or NeurIPS published author, which is, we're, we're so excited to have him on the show. And you're saying that in traditional model-based reinforcement learning, planning is done by computing the expected result of a sequence of future actions using an explicit model of, of the environment. And it's fairly well assumed in the RL community that these planning methods um, improve the sample efficiency problem, which, which, is a, which is a huge issue. So how do you go on to address this planning issue in, in your architecture so the the key problem in in using planning with these learned networks is that the planning process uh, shoots off immediately out of the 
family family manifold and then then the network can give complete rubbish there have been other solutions so some some people have tackled this problem by uh, plugging in proper bayesian uh, uncertainty so it's it's really down to not aleatory but epistemic uncertainty so it's the epistemic uncertainty that that kills this this planning and rather than than build this complicated bayesian machinery and i'm i'm bayesian that's hard so i i think bayesian is great but we don't want to implement bayesian stuff at the microscopic level of of these networks so if you think like in in bayesian terms your epistemic uncertainty is is found when you go outside of your training domain so when when the probability of your input starts being small compared to what, what your training data would suggest. And we, we found a way to, to train a neural network, a denoising autoencoder, to effectively figure out what the training distribution is and give the gradients that point uh, uphill in this uh, Mm, probability distribution of the training training data and that's uh, that that gradient is is the key to like it's, it's the antidote against this adversarial planning attack so during planning every planning step where you are optimizing your objective function it, it gives goes upward here in the target uh, target objective function but then it goes downhill the probability of your input data so we remedy that by pushing it back back up then maybe the the objective will also go down a little bit but that's okay because it's better to uh, be realistic about your objective function rather than if if objective function goes up and probability goes down then the objective is what the network thinks is very high high objective is actually not uh, so we 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 keep pushing the probability of input up so as to keep the epistemic uncertainty of this model as low as possible and like if you do the maths you can see that there there is a term that we need there which is the gradient of log probability of your input this input trajectory and turns out that uh, noising autoencoders very naturally output this this kind of value this is something that we we actually uh, proved uh, thoroughly there is i think we have an archive paper about that so we we didn't publish it in any any conference or anything it's it's a thing that has been known to hold approximately already before but we we showed the exact relation so these denoising autoencoders are actually giving the gradient of log probability of of the input distribution so actually we can i mean we haven't properly shouted out the paper it's called regularizing trajectory optimization with denoising autoencoders so for anyone you know who wants to check that out so is it is it fair to if i had to describe the the paper on a high level is it fair to say that if i'm planning with a model that i also learn then i run into i run into this danger of of basically planning where my model doesn't really know stuff yet and if i'm not a bayesian as you say then i can't I sort of can't know that my model doesn't know stuff. Now, what other other papers try to do is kind of like guess, guess that I don't know stuff, or they try to actually push the model or the exploration towards that space where I don't know, where my model doesn't know things. And therefore they say, okay, in future iterations, I, you know, if I push if i go there in future iterations i will know what's happening there but you you go a different way you basically say that i know my planning will fail once i go to a place where my model doesn't know so i make sure that my planning process actually only goes to where my model is where i know my model is good is that kind of does this describe it and does that 
describe the the relevant thing? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thing. Uh, yeah. And to be to be fair, there have been many many other proposals in this direction. For instance, Ilco is is implicitly at least doing that by using Gaussian processes as the underlying model. And they are really, really good at modeling the epistemic uncertainty. Uh, like it's, it's inbuilt in, in this model structure. However, they are pretty cumbersome. Like you, you wouldn't like to apply this kind of Gaussian process when you have an say oil refinery with thousands of measurements and hundreds of control variables. You just wouldn't like to apply a Gaussian process for that. <clears throat> and these deep neural networks, they are great. They can learn these kinds of very complex processes. So the path we took was to, rather than try to somehow change the deep neural network so that it would manage this epistemic uncertainty, we we built a kind of safety net around it. So so it's keeping this planning process safe. But yeah, you you are correct, and there have been this this kind of regularization, which is trying to be conscious of of the input distribution. That it has been used even in in control theory, it's just that the the models have been far simpler. So something like, for instance, mixture of Gaussians model for for the input distribution, and now if you have a very complex process model, a deep neural network, LSTM with uh, multiple layers and, and whatnot. Uh, it's like you have this Lamborghini, you have great machine under you. And then if you are forced to use input distribution model like mixture of Gaussians, it's like, okay, then we have this five kilometers per hour speed limit. So what was the purpose of buying the Lamborghini in the first place? So rather what we are we are doing is we are using an other deep neural network which understands the input distribution. And there could have been other alternatives, like for instance, variational autoencoders or or something like that. But the trouble is that if you if your network outputs a probability of the input and then you are optimizing it through gradients or some other very efficient optimization method, then the optimization process is bound to find weaknesses, joint weaknesses in your predictive model and then this distribution model. We tried it, it failed. So another very popular alternative is to use an ensemble of models to model the epistemic uncertainty. So the idea is that once you have multiple different models, then um, when you go outside of, of your training distribution, then the models start disagreeing, and you can you can measure the epistemic uncertainty with an ensemble. We've tested that, and it just breaks immediately if you apply efficient planning techniques like gradient-based planning. If the planning itself is a little bit inefficient, then you can get away with that. But uh, I think it's very uh, dangerous to rely on using imperfect optimization techniques to do model-based reinforcement learning. So I'd rather fix the, the root cause of the problem and then use the most efficient optimization technique there is. So with, with, these, with these ensembles, is it that if I have a really efficient planner, it will just find the point where all the ensembles dis, like, are wrong, but in the same way. Yeah, exactly. So they, they're, they're basically saying, all oh, they're saying the same thing. So you yeah. say, well, this is a really sure bet, but you're basically just adversarial exampling all of them at the same yeah. time. And okay. as long as you have a low dimensional uh, control space where you you don't have that many variables to optimize, that might be fine. But when you start having tens or hundreds of control variables to optimize at the same time, you are doomed. Yeah. Could you define uh, just for the benefit of any any listeners that don't know what it means? Because I think it has quite a specific uh, definition: epistemic uncertainty. Oh yeah, sorry, I used aleatoric and epistemic as if that would be known to everybody. So. Aleatoric refers to the kind of uncertainty that you have in what, throwing dice, for instance. Like even though we know the dynamics of these dice pretty well, every time I throw dice, I it, I, I get a different answer. So 
alea. It's, it's the Latin. Uh, what's that in English? Uh, ice has been thrown or ha- ice has been cast or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I had so, a look on Wikipedia and it said uh, some sometimes a measurement may not be accurate because the model neglects certain effects or because particular data has been deliberately hidden. So an example yeah, of this they quote but, uh, is the, I, I the drag that, yeah, on, on quantum, a car. Quantum physics pretty much uh, guarantees that you are going to have aleatoric uncertainty in anything that you you do. So it has to be really a game environment in order for you not to have aleatoric uncertainty. But the, the, the moment you hit physics, you will hit aleatoric uncertainty. So quantum physics is all about aleatoric uncertainty, for instance. You, you do the same experiment million times and every time you get slightly different different answer. So yeah, that's that's aleatoric. And this is easy type of uncertainty because you can basically learn that from data, uh, training data. You can you can reliably train networks that output probabilities rather than just uh, crisp values. Uh, that's because the network will will see multiple different outcomes for the same input, and it, it will learn to output a distribution properly. But epistemic uncertainty is when the model doesn't know yet. Typically, that's because we haven't seen these kinds of things yet. Or maybe we've seen something like that, but while waiting, the the world went and changed and this is this is very typical in in for instance industrial processes yes we have years and years of data but these processes keep changing all the time without telling us unfortunately so by the time that you you get your uh, of number process and you are supposed to make the decision your training data is already invalid so that's epistemic uncertainty, something which we do not know yet. We when typically happens when you go outside your your training data, but it, it can also be that the training data is there, but the model just went and changed. I'm interested in your process as, as a company to use Yannick's example again. What would success look like and what would the process be? for you to start to develop these models and, and put them together. And when Google and DeepMind create models like this, they have huge teams and they have vast amounts of compute. And there is still an element of it being a black art and being trial and error and, and quite experimental. What does your process look like? So we are packaging this this model-based reinforcement learning into a toolbox that any control engineer would be able to use without understanding all the finesses of machine learning. They are typically experts of their uh, domain processes. So um, they, they, they understand the measurements and controls and all of that stuff, and they are needed. In, in these projects, uh, we are we are packaging this model-based reinforcement learning into a toolbox, which which these people would be able to use. They need to understand the concept of training data and training a model and validating the model, uh, but they wouldn't need to know all about dropouts and LSTM and you know all of these machine learning stuff that uh, we we breathe. <laughs> Uh, every, every day so that's that's how success was, would look like democratizing model based reinforcement learning so that it's not cool anymore <laughs> you, you you mentioned at the very beginning you mentioned something like system 2 and and especially humans learn rules very quickly right and once you learn the rule behind something you make this great progress and what comes to mind to me also from the more classical AI is things like planning over over these causal factor graphs and explainability when you say you know the rules I learned the rule and I have these causal models do you see do you see any role for these types of things in the system two AIs or yeah absolutely and now actually we're touching a point uh, which which relates also to using these simulators, not just for control, but also for analysis. Like when when we encounter a new situation, 
that we haven't seen before, we can apply system two thinking in analysis. We can run simulations. So my, my favorite example is Sherlock Holmes arriving at the crime scene and seeing scratch in the sofa and lipstick in the mirror and then by some okay so running some internal simulations obviously Sherlock uh, declares it was a ballet dancer I don't know how he does it but somehow he uh, arrives at a wonderful conclusion so he's he's built this whole simulation of the whole setup in his head mm -hmm. and this this kind of way of analyzing the world is something that system two AI is also capable of doing. And I mean, that's, that's something that curious AI has been working on. We, we were working on document automation using generative modeling, like, you know, simulating where fi finding an explanation of where did this document come from? Like, why, why are these numbers like we see them and so on? That's something that we've now Put on hold for a while like now we are fully focused on model-based reinforcement learning and industrial processes but definitely uh, having a good causal model that can also explain the data that we see and base its predictions on these kinds of analyses that's something that i i clearly see in the future uh, for the time being we are using system one uh, black box modeling for developing this predictive model mm. but it's also it would be possible to also apply system two ai in building the predictive model itself you would add another layer of explainability to the system but what we've seen is that actually people are pretty happy uh, communicating with this this model-based reinforcement learning AI system in terms of predictions. So they yeah. are happy seeing that the model thinks we should do this because it leads to those consequences. So yeah. we can visualize the predictions of the model. And the system doesn't want to do this other thing because it's predicting those outcomes. Yeah. So it's a very intuitive way of debugging the system and understanding what the system is thinking. And you don't need to know why the system is making these predictions. We don't oftentimes probe other people's understanding here. Sometimes we do, and our AI wouldn't be able to do that right now, yeah. maybe sometimes in the future. Yeah. This is a key philosophical question, the what versus the why. With humans, we don't ask the why. We don't ask airplane pilots why they know what they do. And Yoshi Abengio made the assertion that some knowledge is not verbalizable. I really like that concept, especially when you talk about these black box system one models. I agree with you that when we have this higher level of thinking, this system two, we can place a structure around why we are doing things. But again, in Bengio's talk, he was talking about creating these high level factor graphs, but it doesn't seem possible to be able to learn these factor graphs. As the case has been for many years, we can build models ourselves, which allow us to reason and perform a higher level of introspection and verbalization. But we don't seem to be able to learn this higher level of thinking. I think that there is uh, something still, some some work still to be done in neurosymbolic uh, systems. So systems which are able to do symbolic. Mani simple manipulation with neural architectures. Our brain clearly does it. We we have a neural network inside, and we can pretty certainly do symbolic, simple manipulation. So when when doing abstract mathematics, for instance, we are clearly manipulating symbols. Now we've actually scratched that problem from on the surface a little bit. We were working on something like unsupervised segmentation system so really learning object representations from pixels and our collaborator klaus greff continued that work like modeling in the interactions between these objects and so on 
Curious AI dropped that kind of research for now. So that's another thing that we have put on hold because we've we figured that in in actual reality, when you go and solve real world problems, that's not really the bottleneck most most of the time. Humans are really efficient at um, defining the object structure or the symbolic structure of the problem. And we, we can do that very efficiently and we can apply these black box learning learning systems efficiently in in other other system, other things so like predicting the signals and and so on which don't really require all that much symbolic thinking but i'm i'm quite sure that we this is something that we will still revisit at some point and i'm i'm certain that there there is a way to and i i think that we we even know um a good starting point like where, where to go how to start building these neurosymbolic uh, models which are not only able to predict the individual signals and and so on but which are also able to learn to represent un, in an unsupervised manner learn to represent the world in terms of objects and their interactions. And that's a really, really uh, deep topic, a big topic in and of itself, uh, which a company that actually needs to make something uh, something workable for their, their customers and cannot afford to do now. But one day, w- once we've uh, cracked the all the industrial control problems in the world. I'm sure that we will have some resources dedicated to that problem too. It's quite a, a different plan for the, it, seem, it seems like, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there is this way what you're doing in that you say, you know, there is these industrial control problems. And once we know, we figure out how to basically do this uh, system to latent planning and we figure out how to solve this problem of not planning where we don't know we'll be able to solve these and there's this entire other game that maybe someone like DeepMind is playing where they say we might just be able to solve go and that will make so much pr that people will throw money at us for basically just because we've we we're so good because we basically we have so such good people right and there seems a bit of a it's it seems different trajectories and i'm sure there are a lot of people right now listening or watching that wonder kind of if i want to go into ai with business like as a business person if i want to start my company or join a startup or somewhat do you have any sort of insider recommendation of what's what's sort of the the smartest way to go about if you want to because there's a lot of space still for ai startups right and what's the smartest way to go about doing something like this well i think that there are many smart ways of doing it so there's not just one one model which fits all but i think first of all you need to decide whether you you want to build a company to be an acquisition target rather than build a company which stands on its own uh, for instance, Curious AI, we, we founded a company which is doing its own business and it's not primarily an acquisition target. So, uh, but there, I know other companies that have been quite successful in, in both this way of working and so also companies that have just decided, okay, we'll make a lot of noise about ourselves and then some big company will buy us. It's a, I mean, if, if you want that, then that that's fine that's not something that's uh, not, that wasn't the kind of company that i wanted to build because i think we we really at curious area we we really do have a plan of how to build really really advanced like human style ai if not human level immediately at least human style ai really advanced ai and i think that rather than trying to get us ourselves into uh, as a research department of a bigger company, it makes sense to really, really build business out of this first, and that's that's what we did. If you want to build a business type AI company, some AI company that really has its own business, I think for most AI startups, the the wise strategy is to focus on a particular vertical. 
figure out a problem and then solve that no matter what, AI or not, just solve that particular problem. And that, that makes sense for most companies. It's, it's a little bit like if you are a gaming game company, you, you want to build a cool game. There are only so many companies that can build game engines for other game companies to, to use. Now, Curious AI is, is this kind of game engine type company. We built the, some fundamentally new AI for which we then, then need to figure out what is the bi best business for that. And that's a long path that I wouldn't recommend to, to try at home uh, or at business. Uh, so this, this is the, the hard way. That's the path we chose. And we, we were lucky enough to have visionary enough investors who, who were willing to back this up. And now we are here, like now we can show that, hey, cool model-based reinforcement learning that actually works in the real world. Uh, I'm solving, solving uh, important problems for real companies. We, we are tackling the core processes of big companies. Those, like, if we can get 10% improvement in those core processes, that's a lot of money for these, these companies. So we've definitely found ourselves uh, a really, really good, good market. It only took us four years and without really patient investors, we would have run out of money long, long, long time ago. Yeah, kudos to you for doing so. So many people are really excited about getting into the world of reinforcement learning and, and machine learning, and you are being a trailblazer. You're making this work. I, I discovered you folks on, on LinkedIn and you're having a huge impact already. So kudos to you. Well, thank you. Uh, I think that most of the impact is still to be made, though. Can I ask one quick question? Oh, sorry. What do you think, like, how much is the inference? So I read the paper about closed loop, where you simulate whole entire trajectories, then take one step and then plan again. And then you have the inference speed. So I'm just curious about like real world application of these reinforced learning models. How much is the inference time through these neural networks like a bottleneck in applying this? Well, nowadays it's not a bottleneck at all. And this, this um, so-called receding horizon planning has been uh, bread and butter of control engineering for, for decades. So it's been running out there in industrial process processes and production for, for decades already. And now we have so much more compute at our disposal than, you know, those pioneers way back that it's, it's a non-trivial amount of compute. Uh, so even though Daniel Kahneman talks about system two as the slow thinking, you take modern computers and it's blazingly fast thinking. I've been able to apply that for uh, controlling uh, autonomous vehicles in real time and, and stuff like that. So it's it's not really a problem at all. And in these industrial processes, they are, you know, huge processes with so much inertia in them, like really physical inertia, that they, they the responses there can take hours. We could do hundreds of milliseconds easily even milliseconds with, with modern computers. So this is just non-trivial amount of compute. So do you find any value in things oh, sorry, like... Sorry, sorry, sorry. I meant to oh. say trivial amount of compute. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you find value in things like quantization or pruning or knowledge distillation for compressing the models or it's not even, it's not even a problem and don't even bother with it? There is value in distillation. We are, yeah, that's, that's, that's something that's, that's helpful, but not maybe for the, for, not only for uh, compressing the models, but also for improving generalization. So you do publish obviously this the research that you do and it seems to be you publish quite the some of the core components of of what you do at your company right do you do you also 
like how, how far does this openness go and where do you see the true value of the company? Is it in the code itself or do you, would you, are you open sourcing the code and say, well, no, the actual value is in us going there and actually doing the thing where, what do you, where is the balance between like openness and, and, and doing money like company secret? Yeah, I, I mean, company secret is the default mode for operation in in any any business, I guess. And the the antidote against against that is the patenting system. So companies like say Google, they have their core business, and they they are pretty secretive about that's that business but ai they can publish about uh, for us uh, ai is our core business and if we just publish everything without uh, patenting first then we would be out of business sooner the ra rather than later so we could do a business out of it as long as we stay in the niches where big players wouldn't be so interested. But for a company like us, we are developing new technology and we, we are patenting this new technology. And that makes it possible for us to publish things. Patents are publications. So I think uh, I come from academia. So I know what acad academicians think about patenting and it's, it's evil source of all, all <laughs> evil uh, but that's not really the case like without patenting we wouldn't be able to publish anything really could, could, could you contrast your position on this versus a facebook or a google for example i always used to make the argument that google could release their algorithms because their value was the data the face net triplet loss Siamese network. Yeah, that's a cool architecture. But the best data set in the public domain is, I think it's called Labeled Faces in the Wild, which has 14,000 faces in. Google has a data set which has 26 million faces in. So that's where the value was. But that argument doesn't work anymore because take the latest T5 natural language processing model from Google. They've given it away. They've given the, the trained version that they're giving it away. Presumably they're patenting this as well. I don't know if they are, but how is it different? So I think it's useful to keep in mind that Google's product is not this this kind of uh, speech recognition system. You are the product. Their business is advertising, search engines. If you think about what what Google did in the in the beginning, like PageRank was a clear improvement. Like it it was very much better technology than than their competitors. They didn't really publish that immediately. They didn't reveal all, all their secrets about how they are building their search, search engine. So that's what I mean, that the core business of Google is search, still search engines. And, and this stuff is, is a big part of what Google does. And they are not telling all their secrets about that part of business for sure. Awesome. Well, we are coming up to time. And I would just like to take this opportunity, Hari, uh, just to say thank you so much. It's been an honor to talk with you. I honestly think that you serve as an inspiration for many of our viewers who might one day build their own startup around reinforcement learning and machine learning. And I thoroughly recommend any potential customers who have control problems get in touch with Hari and Curious AI. The, these folks are a wonderful startup. Thank you, Tim. It's it has been such a pleasure and with such an expert expert uh, people like I don't know Yannick how how you did that trick about uh, switch <laughs> in French. Yeah. yeah black magic <laughs> amazing brilliant